Welcome. Uh, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I'm Senior Perception Architect here at Tanger Envision. And today we're going to talk a little bit about understanding calibration from data capture to final results and then back again. So uh, to get started, uh, you know, most calibration procedures kind of follow this sort of rough pipeline thinking. You have data capture, which, you know, tends to leverage some kind of target board or target field. Uh, in most cases, uh, we then run the calibration, which you can see here is this just sort of black box system. And in fact, we're not going to really talk so much about the design of the calibration system itself in this talk, but we're going to kind of treat it as a black box for the purposes of what we're doing today. Um, then the final stage is analyzing results. Um, and so looking at the outputs of this black box system and being able to kind of understand what's happening and use that to feed the rest of the system. Uh, unfortunately, um, most of our systems today kind of separate these out. And so while we have data capture and we have calibration and we have this sort of results analysis or this QAQC that happens, um, each of these are kind of siloed off. And oftentimes when we're building these procedures out, we kind of mess up sort of the, the sum for each of the individual parts themselves. And so one thing we'll find is that since these are walled off systems, you have line operators, you know, doing data capture. I'm sure we all have a, a lovely checkerboard like this sitting in an office or in a, in a cabinet somewhere. Um, you then have engineering whose primarily primary goal is to sort of build this black box system, you know, something that line operators have to interact with, but fundamentally don't spend their time inside. Uh, and then lastly, you have QAQC, which is often separate from both engineering and the line operators themselves. And they'll do things like analyze results, check out statistics, and basically give you sort of like a pass fail criteria on whether your sensors or your robotic platform is calibrated. Um, and so one of the things that we want to talk about today, especially in this kind of webinar, is tying all of this together. Uh, in particular, you know, we know that data capture is driven in part by the results we're getting. Um, this is a, you know, fundamentally a machine learning uh, mechanism or operation uh, from beginning to end. And so the data that we capture is largely going to drive what kind of results we get. So what does that mean for developing a calibration procedure? Um, data capture is dictated by the constraints of the end application. Uh, if you have a robot that's massive and heavy and can't be moved, then, you know, you're not gonna be able to rotate your sensors 90 degrees or anything. So maybe you need to design your board differently. Um, in addition, QAQC tells us how well or poorly we did. Um, you know, a couple of points here that we're going to go through in this presentation. Are all the systematic effects modeled out of our residuals? Uh, are process errors within the tolerance of our application? And like, how does this all relate back to the data that we captured or this black box system that we're using? Um, and so the point that I want to make is that when we're building these calibration procedures, or if you're doing this yourself, uh, the whole process needs to be evaluated holistically. They may be run separately by line operators, engineering, and QAQC as you know, separate org structures, or even just three separate people within your organization. Uh, but you want to be able to have all of these things speak to each other, and you want to have some process of understanding when uh, something goes wrong in the QAQC side, how does that feed back into data capture? Or does that feed back into the black box? Um, and so what do we think about when we think about calibration quality? How do we make a good calibration? The first thing that we often think about is RMSEs of reprojection errors. And so what I'm gonna be showing you in the next couple slides is some of the output that we have with Tangram's uh, calibration platform. And this kind of shows some of the metrics that we provide and some of the uh, ways in which we visualize that. And so here, the key things that we want to talk that I wanted to point out here are these last three rows, the RMSE for a given set of three cameras. And you can see that the reprojection error is 0.2 pixels, more or less across the board. Um, so you might be inclined to say, oh, 0.2 pixels reprojection error per each camera. That's actually pretty good. Um, you know, maybe there's nothing wrong with this calibration. Uh, and so that can often be the initial impression when thinking about reprojection errors, uh, is to just sort of take this blanche summary statistic and then assume that everything's fine. Uh, 
However, if we actually plot these reprojection errors out, sometimes you can find that that's not actually the case. Uh, and so we have uh, two graphs here on the left and the right, and these are two graphs of sort of the radial reprojection error versus the radial distance in the image from the principal point. Uh, and so on the left, you can see that we have this nice flat curve. Um, there's not really a shape to it at all. It's all centered at zero and it's like pretty tightly constrained. And on the right, we have this big curve shape that you can see kind of like a sinusoid um, in our reprojection errors and residuals as we plot them. And looking at that, you can also see that it's a lot wider. Um, but if we were to just look at some of the summary statistics, these would both mostly have a mean of zero. And the standard deviation on one of them might be a little bit higher. It might be plus or minus one pixel or plus or minus one or half a pixel over here. But at its core, what we're seeing is that these are two very different calibrations. And so what does that mean? What are we seeing in the right calibration that we're not seeing in the left? And to kind of give away the surprise here, I've artificially changed some of the model on the right-hand side, but there's kind of two things that can go into this. When we see systematic effects, this can either be a result of picking a poor model, so our black box is not optimizing the right thing, or data capture. And in particular, that our data capture is insufficient to fully encompass what we're trying to model with this camera. Um, and so plotting our residuals in a way like this is one way in which we can garner a little bit more information on the QAQC side as to what might be happening during data capture. And by relating those two together, we can learn a lot about our calibrations. And so uh, just keep in mind these curves as we go through sort of the next couple of slides here. Um, so this is another visualization from our software. Um, and this shows sort of this black line that outlines this square, the camera frame. And each of these points are where in the frame we've seen observations. Uh, and so you could imagine this as I am holding, you know, my checkerboard up here. There will only be points where the corner is relative to the camera frame itself. Part of the data capture process and something that we see often is that parts like this part of the frame are kind of unobserved. And this can happen due to vignetting in the image, can happen due to just poor data capture process. But if we don't have a nice, even, uniform distribution of points that we see distributed across this frame, then oftentimes that's when you start to get into this situation on the right. Uh, in this particular case, I did give away that I artificially imposed this because otherwise it would be very hard for Tangram system to one, have this many points and show this curve and two, demonstrate that kind of data capture anomaly. Uh, but for the sake of what we're going through today, um, I hope you'll just take it on sort of trust that if you don't have enough of these points and you don't have a nice even coverage, you won't be able to fully model that curve as you go farther and farther from the radial center. So modeling distortion can be quite difficult based off of how you capture your data. Um, ultimately, this gives us, this leads to us giving guidelines to our customers. Um, you know, don't have your checkerboard way out in the back over here and try your best to get even uniform coverage of everything nice and close. Uh, one of the trade-offs is that you don't want to be so close that your board is out of focus, but you also don't want to be so far that you're not getting any points. So what can we say about systematic effects in the calibration? Uh, they can be the result of modeling errors of data capture. Um, to model distortion correctly, we want to check coverage across the scene. This is something that's very easy to do uh, sort of generally in any calibration system. Uh, some make them easier than others, Tangrams in particular, you know, I was able to generate those visualizations because that is a tool we've developed. It's something that we see very common across many different partners that we work with um, trying to do camera calibration. Um, and most interior lens effects, especially on cameras, can be observed by analyzing the residuals. If we ever see in any situation that we have some sort of sinusoid or weird uh, mathematic expression that's not centered at zero, 
and very tightly compact for most of our points, then we can generally assume that we have some unmodeled systematic effects throughout the calibration. And that can be, again, the result of modeling or data capture. So some recommendations for data capture, get closer to the camera. Uh, very easy. You know, if I'm taking my big checkerboard and I'm way, 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 way out here, and you can see this in the, the camera frame if it's still showing my uh, stream, uh, that's very different than if I get a lot closer and show the camera and the checkerboard to get full overlap. This doesn't always mean that we need to take all of our photos or sort of all of our frames up nice and close, but adding at least a couple frames where you do have that full field of view coverage uh, works. And this is especially important with uh, cameras that have high field of view. So like wide angle cameras, ultra wides and fisheye lenses. All right, so taking a step back from that, I now want to talk a little bit about what we call the object space or our object space design. So we've all seen these checkerboards before. Uh, I'm showing a couple of different examples here. We have uh, sort of your standard Chiruko, like I just showed beside me. Here's kind of the uh, caliber April grid board it has much smaller uh, black squares in between. And then on the right side here, I've kind of shown off uh, some common examples of how, you know, a LIDAR object space might look like, or a LIDAR target field, if you're trying to calibrate, you know, a Velodyne or some other kind of laser scanner. Um, all of these are using signalized targets that we can sort of automatically extract. That's not necessarily required for what I'm gonna talk about, but I did wanna kind of touch on how do we choose what targets we wanna capture? Where do we put the targets? Um, what in the QAQC process can inform this when we're developing this calibration procedure? Because you know, it's pretty expensive to manufacture targets consistently. Um, but if we get a little bit of an intuition of what we want to build, this can easily drive a lot of the quality that you might uh, otherwise be leaving on the table uh, whenever you're trying to do some kind of sensor calibration. So uh, just to jump in the chat here real quick, I want to play a bit of a game. So I've got two boards here, and I want you to spot the difference between them. Um, can anybody in the chat tell me what is the difference between these two boards? There is a difference. I'm not, I'm not messing with you. They're not the same board, um, but there is a difference between these two. They do look the same. Uh, the whites on the right ones are not brighter. That, that may actually be that may indeed be that your, your screen is perhaps playing an optical illusion on you. Um, you guys like maybe 30 more seconds to think about it. It's not DPI. Um, aliasing, uh, that's you're getting close. Aliasing is actually probably the closest guess that you might have. Um, so these two boards are fundamentally the same layout um, and they have the same number of squares on each side. They have the same coloring, uh, but one's rotated 180 degrees relative to the other one. And because this board is fully symmetric, it's impossible to spot the difference. And if you can't spot the difference yourself, your robot can't either. It has no way of knowing if this object space is rotated at zero degrees or 180 degrees. And so this leads us to some, to some discussion about like how we design object spaces or how we design our targets. Uh, first off, let's make our targets unambiguous. Uh, in particular, avoid axis and rotational symmetry. Um, you know, we have this board here that I've been using as a bit of a prop. Uh, if I rotate this board, 180 degrees, uh, our detector will always know which corner is which because these Aruko tags are always unique across the entirety of the board. And so it's possible to track this Aruko tag as it moves around. Um, this cannot be said of regular checkerboards that are perfectly symmetric. And a similar problem exists in sort of object spaces that we construct for doing LIDAR and camera calibration. If you have something that's perfectly symmetric and has some ambiguity to it, then it's often impossible to uniquely and consistently reconstruct that geometry. And 
that causes a huge problem down the line because now you've got a lot of observations that may be uh, somewhat ambiguous with regards to the optimization process. And that can sometimes result in weird effects like calculating camera poses that are behind the board um, or calculating camera poses that are in a geometry that makes no sense whatsoever. So on that same note, with regards to unambiguous targets, prefer variation in all dimensions. We'll talk about this a bit in a second, but flat object spaces like a flat checkerboard can be worked with, but it does make some aspects more difficult. Um, and yeah, I see Ilya underscore S here said, um, stop using chessboard targets. I would say yes, I agree with that. Uh, I don't know, for some folks, you know, that that is a constraint. Uh, you need something that's cheap and easily available. Uh, lastly, size movement must match sensor constraints. So, you know, we want to make sure that these checkers are detectable at operating distance. Um, you know, target size trades off against the number of available targets. Uh, if I make a checkerboard that has many more checkers, I'll get more observed points. Uh, but at the same time, it'll be harder to observe those points as we step farther and farther back. Um, and this matters a lot when you're trying to get cross coverage or overlap between multiple sensors. All right. So let's talk about flat target boards or checkerboards like what I've got over here. Um, they're pretty ubiquitous. There's something that's like readily available. You know, they're easy to generate. There's probably a hundred different generators you could find just by Googling it uh, really quickly to get a PDF to print off or to quickly order, order like a foam core board or a piece of wainscoting. You can just, you know, put a piece of paper on. I, there's plenty of ways I've seen people build checkerboards. Um, they're easy to get, they're easy to acquire, they're easy to use, but it does place some constraints on our process. Uh, in particular, the flatness of the board itself um, does have an ambiguity in scale. So kind of what we call the dollhouse problem. Um, the dollhouse problem is the idea that if you take a photo of a house and you take a photo of a dollhouse and they look perfectly identical, your camera has no way of knowing that the scale is completely different on those. Um, and so we have this issue where scale and principal distance um, become much more difficult to estimate. And you see that in the focal length term uh, when you do your calibration for cameras. Uh, conversely, let's say your object space is not perfectly flat. You can see here on my board, you know, it's got a bit of wiggle to it. It's not perfectly flat. Um, and yet, if I were to do sort of the standard calibration adjustment, um, you know, I might be assuming that it is perfectly flat. And those errors aren't going to be propagated into the board itself. They're going to go back into the rest of my adjustment. So what can we do about that? Um, so dealing with flatness. Uh, one of the key ways to deal with flatness is going to be getting a convergence angle. Um, and so what does that mean? I've tried to show some sort of top down and side views to demonstrate what it means to get a good convergence angle uh, when capturing data. Uh, and so if you find that you're having issues with estimating scale or you're seeing a lot of errors being projected back because um, your object space seems to be pushing a lot of errors into the rest of your calibration, um, convergence angle is probably the most important thing you can do to take care of that. So what does that mean for me in the data capture process? I'm capturing data to calibrate my webcam up there. Um, and I want to get some convergence angle. If I just move side to side like this, um, I'm not adding a whole lot to my adjustment. And in fact, uh, a lot of that data is going to just look like a slight shift in pose of the camera versus whether or not um, it actually observes that the board has moved itself. However, if I rotate it, a shift in one direction of the pose of the camera is going to vastly change based off of the angle. And so by collecting data at 35 degrees, 35 degrees, 35 degrees vertically, and 35 degrees the other way vertically, we're able to get a convergence angle. And a convergence angle is sort of the total angle across all of the angular measurements that we make. Um, so you can see in the example, 35 degrees one way, negative 35 the other, is 70 degrees total. So 
high convergence angles improve results for pretty much every object space we can generate, um, whether that be for LIDAR, for cameras, standard checkerboards, Chiruko boards, um, something a little bit more comprehensive than that. Uh, convergence angles will almost always improve results because you're observing the same points from different perspectives. And in being able to do that, you're able to get redundant information in case there's errors in any of those individual observations. Uh, and I've pasted you know, a couple of these uh, links here, a couple of these references um, going back as far as 1972. And for anyone who's curious, we'll have these slides available. There'll be a video and all that if, if you guys wanted to check these, uh, check these references out yourself. But many of these references going all the way back to 1972 is the first I've really seen of this is talking about analytical self-calibration and how important high convergence angles are in performing a consistent and repeatable and seen independent calibration. Um, the original Zhang, uh, Zhang paper here from 2000 is probably what a lot of you who've worked in computer vision have probably read before. Um, it's kind of the seminal paper on uh, sort of computer vision driven calibration. Uh, that being said, you know, this, this is not new stuff. This is stuff we've known since at least the seventies. It's just not been something that's been widely taught or widely referenced. Um, there's one last point I wanna make about convergence though. Uh, can anyone guess, is there any problem with what I was showing off with convergence up until now? Uh, I'll give y'all in the chat just a minute to respond. Uh, yeah, so direction is actually a good thing. Um, so if I'm trying to get a convergence angle, you know, what what is perhaps one problem with me trying to maximize my convergence angle as much as possible with this big flat planar field? Hard to fill the old image with the pattern. It's true. It is hard to fill the image with the pattern. Um, we want to have a variety of data. So it's not just that we always get sort of the, um, the uh, filling the whole image with the pattern. We want to be able to get shots like that, but then also get some convergence as well as we step back. And especially when we're trying to get uh, overlap between two sensors. Uh, detection accuracy suffers. Yes, Ben Leslie uh, has more or less nailed the point. If I were to get the maximum convergence angle, I would turn 90 degrees and I would turn negative 90 degrees. And now I can't see any points. So there is a limit to which we can actually use convergence angle to correct some of our problems. Uh, in particular, if you cannot detect corners anymore because you have too extreme of an angle, uh, then it's not really adding anything to your adjustment because you're not adding observations at all. You're not detecting any corners. Um, Andreas has also made a good point. Turning the board might bend it more. Uh, that might be true depending on how stable your board is. This is pretty light foam core, so you can see it kind of just kind of flexes as I go. Um, depending on your calibration system, I know at least for the one we've developed here at Tangram, we optimize for that. So we actually optimize to know how much bend is in the board, um, sort of as a function of the calibration itself. Um, and so that is uh, one thing that is unique to our system that I know of at least, um, but may be a problem in others. Uh, and yeah, overall pose estimation does become quite unstable sort of as you make those angles larger and larger, but that's largely a function of our detection accuracy. And so, this last point here, convergence trades off against our ability to detect corners, um, in particular in the pathological case as uh, you know, you get to 90 degrees. All right, so we've talked about you know, how to design the object space. We've talked about removing systemic or systematic errors from our adjustment, or at least identifying when they're there. Um, one last point I wanna talk about are parameter covariances and projective compensation. And I will define both of these. Um, but the first thing I want to say is that a lot of times we look at reprojection errors and a lot of times we look to see if these systematic effects exist within sort of the optimized coordinates of our object space or to see if there's just something blanket wrong with our entire process that seems to constantly fail. 
Uh, but a good way to tell is to look at the actual covariances that are calibration process outputs uh, for each parameter that it optimizes. Uh, because reprojection errors don't tell us everything, right? Um, kind of showed that in the first bit where we have really low reprojection errors of like 0 0.2, but that doesn't stop you from having one of those sinusoid patterns, or it doesn't really tell you if those reprojection errors are just optimized according to some process. And so they're inherently meant to be small. Uh, you know, if your entire optimization is a least squares process that minimizes the reprojection error, then you should expect that even with a bad calibration, um, that reprojection error should be, you know, minimized or quote unquote small. And so oftentimes I try to tell people, okay, which would you say is better? F is equal to 100 plus or minus 10 pixels, or F is equal to 97.8 plus or minus two pixels. Um, and I think most of us would probably agree that uh, that second one, 97.8 plus or minus 2 pix 0.2 pixels is going to be a lot better because that window of error, that plus or minus 0 0.2 is much smaller than that plus or minus 10. Um, so one, how do we interpret covariance and what does that mean for projective compensation? We've written a blog on this on our, on our blog itself uh, to kind of talk about projective compensation, what it is, how we detect it, what does it mean for our adjustment? And I'll go through that in a little bit and give you kind of a crash course. But at its core, we want to know, like, if something's going wrong, how do we detect it if the reprojection errors don't tell us what's going on? So let's look at an example. Um, let's say we do an adjustment uh, and we get some value for focal length CX and CY. And I've intentionally limited this example to only be three parameters so that we don't get into some, you know, weird multi-dimensional thousand by a thousand matrix space, uh, which would be, you know, a bit overbearing. Um, so we get a covariance matrix that's output and it's got elements on the diagonal, two, three, and three, and it's got zeros in the off diagonal. I've chosen zero for now to simplify the example, um, but we'll go through what would what would it mean if they weren't zero in a little bit? So these diagonals are fundamentally what's most important to us. These are the individual parameter variances. As you can see on the top, I have uh, linked sort of which columns and rows belong to which parameter. And so if you have focal length and focal length, then the variance of the focal length is two. If you have CX and CX, the variance is three, and CY and CY, and the variance is again, three. Um, so how did I get that plus or minus bit in that last slide? You know, how, how do I get the plus or minus 0.2 or whatever I'm saying? We have this covariance matrix. It's output as a function of our calibration. And that's something that Tangram actually provides as part of our outputs. Uh, if you're using OpenCV or perhaps other calibration products on the market, you may have to do some work to extract this yourself, but it's definitely possible. Um, so how do we get that? Well, standard deviations are the square root of the variance. Um, pretty classic statistics. So F, you know, the variance of F is the square root of two, which is plus or minus 1.414 pixels. Uh, and then for CX and CY, it's the square root of three, which is plus or minus 1.732 pixels. Um, and so from that, we're able to take those variance values and we're able to make a statement about how well we estimated something. So when you get to the end of your calibration, you're able to analyze these values and, and like from a numerical perspective, say, you know, if I do a calibration and I get plus or minus 10 pixels on focal length, that's going to be significantly worse than if I do a calibration and I get plus or minus 1.414. Um, and so by doing this, you're able to establish criteria for one, how well are you able to observe these values in practice? And then two, um, what, what do you accept uh, sort of as your, as your, um, sort of broader process. So when you're doing all this data capture and you're adding these different poses and getting convergence, what kind of effect does that have on these standard deviations and this variance overall? Uh, all right. So once you've kind of established that for at least this very simple diagonal case, you get the variances of each of your parameters, you establish, okay, these are the criteria for what we want to see. We want to estimate in the calibration the focal length within plus or minus two pixels or something like that. Um, what are all these off diagonal values? Because here I've told you I've simplified it by setting them to zero. Uh, 
Um, and so what does that tell us about uh, the adjustment if they're not zero? So in classic statistics, uh, the off diagonals being zero would be indicative of uh, sort of a correlation. Um, and so we can turn these covariance matrices into a set of correlations between parameters. Um, so we can find if the determination of F and CX, for example, are dependent on each other. If they're completely zero, that means the parameters are independent. Um, and if the correlation is one or negative one, then that means that they're completely dependent on each other. And any errors in the determination of one parameter completely correspond to any errors in the determination of the other. So <clears throat> what that is often called, or what we've chosen to use for this language is projective compensation. It means that um, the determination of one parameter is being compensated for by errors projected into it from another parameter. Um, and so when we see high correlations between two parameters in our final uh, covariance matrix, we get the sense that there's something going wrong about our data capture, or there's something going wrong about the way that we've modeled this that we should be able to go back and fix because we expect that, you know, focal length and the principal offset in X shouldn't be correlated, right? How we determine two values on two different dimensions shouldn't really be affecting one another so tightly. Um, and so I wanted to kind of go through a process or a little example here of how we can preemptively study what's going on by examining the first derivative of one parameter with respect to another. Um, and so let's go through that example real quick. I apologize to any of you who might see, you know, LaTeX on the board and immediately feel like you're back in university or, or back in a lecture hall. Uh, and that's not my intention here. Uh, but just to go through this example real quick, uh, this first equation that I've shown is sort of the standard uh, collinearity uh, pinhole projection equation that we use for just about everything in computer vision. Um, and so we have uh, X is normally on the left side, although I've switched it here to put it in terms of CX. And you'll see why I did that in a second. Um, but effectively, you have the focal length times the rotation from the camera's pose to sort of the image plane um, multiplied by uh, X minus the translation of the camera pose and over Z minus Z translation of the camera pose. Um, if you're not familiar with this um, and your eyes are starting to glaze over, uh, please just bear with me for a second. Uh, this is a common analytical technique that we can apply to any model equation for any sensor calibration to get a sense of why some of our data might produce certain projective compensations or certain high correlations between parameters in our output. Um, and so what we do is we take the derivative of, we'll say XC, which is our X translation with respect to uh, CX, which is our principal image offset in the X direction. Uh, and what we get out of that is negative F times this big equation over here. These little R's are the subcomponents of the big R matrix. So the first column, first row, and the third column, first row, um, or sorry, third row, first column, and first row, first column uh, of those equations, of that matrix. Um, by simplifying this, uh, this equation in terms of uh, Euler angles, if we were to do it that way, um, we eventually get this equation right here. So we see um, the partial derivative of CX with respect to XC is equal to the focal length times the cosine of kappa, which is the rotation angle around Z, divided by this translation of the Z, the, the object point in 3D space of Z minus the pose of the camera. Um, and so what am I trying to describe here? I'm trying to describe the correlation between data as we move left and right. So how does the translation in left and right in X um, correlate to that CX value? So our principal point offset to find the center of the image in X on the image plane. So if we actually only have data where kappa is zero, uh, 
and we do this back and forth. We have no rotation on any other angles and it's purely kappa is always zero. What does that do to this function? Well, to spoil it, both the numerator and the denominator of this function, uh, sort of this cost relationship that we see that's implicit between these two parameters is constant. And so if our board is mostly flat and we have zero rotation, then the relative cost is always going to be the exact same value. And so because of that, they're perfectly correlated and errors are indistinguishable because no matter where we optimize on a flat line, it's always going to be the minimum. And so there's no way for us to differentiate these two values when we're doing the mathematics. And so I hope just kind of walking you through this simple exercise kind of demonstrates one, the analytical technique of taking these derivatives and looking at what would happen as these, as data is collected and how to change how your data is collected as a function of the math that you're seeing. Um, but two, to think about ways in which you might just avoid this entirely. And so, as I said, if there's zero rotation and our board is mostly flat, then the cost between these parameters is constant. And so if I rotate around Z and then start moving around, then that cosine kappa no longer just goes to one because all of our data doesn't express the limit of kappa going to zero. And so as a result of that, um, these errors are no longer perfectly correlated and you start to see some differences between them. And this is another reason why convergence angle and different rotations with the board is so important to your calibration. Um, because oftentimes we get a calibration and it kind of looks right. And it kind of seems like all the reprojection errors are okay. And it kind of seems like our object space is beating most of the criteria, but it still doesn't work in practice. And more often than not, it's small tricks like this, increasing um, your convergence angle, rotating the board while you're capturing data, uh, getting closer to the camera that really gives that benefit. All right, so kind of to run the whole thing in conclusion here, reprojection errors don't always tell us everything we need to know how to make a repeatable and resilient calibration procedure. Like, they can tell you a lot, and there's a lot about them that's useful to look at, especially if you do that graphical analysis, um, like many of Tangram's tools show. Uh, but they can't tell us everything we need to know, and they can't always give us all of the information to understand how data capture should be performed, or what are we seeing in QC, and how do we link that back to either the modeling in that black box, or the data capture that our line operators need to do. So I hope kind of going through all of this process, you've also come to the conclusion that this calibration procedure really has to be designed holistically. We can't do this in a vacuum. Um, we have to know everything from how we design our object space to how we move the board to what statistics are we computing and what is QAQC looking at to be able to really understand the calibration from beginning to end. Um, and lastly, I would just say, this is maybe the part of the presentation where I'm giving a little bit of a pitch, um, but prefer tools that allow you to introspect this calibration problem. Uh, oftentimes it's, it's preferable to kind of reach for the first thing available and think, okay, this kind of gets me going. Um, maybe we can just kind of figure this out as we go. It doesn't give us all the data we need, whatever. Um, but understanding the problem and being able to get these metrics and do this analysis and be able to deeply think and understand these procedures from beginning to end are always going to supersede that guesswork. Um, you, you know, we had a common uh, saying back when I was in grad school, it was like, uh, you know, two months in the lab will save you two hours in the library. And so this is kind of where I pitched Tangram at least a little bit to say that when we do calibrations, we always offer all of these metrics and all of this sort of uh, data to customers as they want. Um, not because we think that that's, you know, you know, not necessary to be able to solve the problem or not because we're just using it anyway, but because there's like a fundamental thought process into this of like everyone's designing their calibration procedure for their own purposes. And it's going to be driven by the requirements of their organization and of the platform that they're trying to calibrate. 
And if you don't have the ability to introspect and look at these things, you won't be able to make good decisions about what's happening in your calibration or how can you improve things or how do you train uh, line operators or how do you automate line operators? So uh, prefer Tangram. We offer all of these things and more available as part of our calibration packages today. I uh, can't speak to other platforms too much because I would honestly say that I don't entirely know the full scope of every other product on the market, which I hope you'll all forgive me for. Uh, <laughs> uh, but with that said, I'm done. So thank you for listening to me for the last 40 some minutes. Uh, really appreciate it. You can always reach out to me at jeremy.steward at tangramvision.com. Or if you wanted to bother me on Twitter, um, I'm at that geo guy. Uh, pretty active there as well. So feel free to say hi or give me a follow. Uh, 